Hey everybody and welcome to chapter 12, DNA technology. So far we've learned about DNA, we've learned what it's made of, we learned what it does. So now we're actually gonna learn how that can be useful in modern day life. So we know that DNA makes us us and it encodes for our genes and it gives us our traits like curly hair or freckles. Okay, but how else can DNA technology be helpful for us? So this is what we're gonna be talking about today. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, what most of you guys probably don't realize is that we're using DNA technology a lot. So sometimes what we can do is we can do really fun and novel things like creating glow-in-the-dark jelly, sorry, glow-in-the-dark fish. So these are actually fish that have had DNA like recombined in a very specific way to give them this fluorescent color. So this is something that we've been able to do that's kind of like a novelty. So we're basically messing with a fish's genes to give it the traits that we want. Now this is something that we're able to do when it comes to certain animals. Um, obviously we're not there yet when it comes to people because that's kind of like ethical issues, which we're gonna get into a little bit later on. Um, but for right now, we're gonna be talking about these novel ideas, but basically how you can recombine DNA to get what you want out of it. So in this case, like I said, we have these fish that are not naturally glow in the dark, but what they do is basically through what's called genetic engineering, and you can kind of think of this as like Jurassic Park or Jurassic World, where they're going in there and they're recombining a little bit of, um, I think in Jurassic World it was like frog DNA, and then in Jur uh, Jurassic, sorry, Jurassic Park it was like frog DNA, and then Jurassic World it was like frog DNA, and cuttlefish DNA, and T-Rex DNA, and Velociraptor DNA. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking all these different types of DNA from different organisms, and you're chopping up little bits and pieces that you want and you're recombining them into the DNA that you want or the traits that you want. We talked last week about gene expression, right? The expression of your genes, meaning you have the gene for curly hair, you show curly hair. So now kind of what we're doing is we're picking and choosing those genes that we want and we're recombining them. And that's how we get fun things like this glow in the dark uh, fish, which actually is a real thing. So it's kind of used for like kids and night lights and stuff like that. Um, not probably the most efficient way of using genetic recombination, but you know, certainly a fun one. So again, this is a direct manipulation of what we want. The genes that we want, we're gonna pick and choose and then put them into say the organism that we want. Now specifically how this happens is what you have what's known as a restrictive site, okay? Oh, sorry, a recognition site. So these recognition sites, so this is kind of like where you want, like the genes that you want. And so say in this case, these are going to be our DNA, right, our given DNA. And this little restrictive enzyme is going to come in and it's actually going to chop up your DNA in a very specific spot. Now, these guys are very, uh, again, kind of like enzymes. They're used only one time for one specific substrate. Same thing kind of here with these recognition sites. Right? These, sorry, these restriction enzymes chopping at these recognition sites. So they really only recognize the one site, the one recognition site. So basically they come in and they separate the DNA. Okay, so as they separate the double helix DNA, they open it up and kind of chop it up into these little fragments. So these fragments right here can be the DNA that you want. Say you're trying to remove parts of the DNA. You use your restrictive enzymes to cut at that very specific recognition site and remove that little bit of DNA. Okay, so say this is the glowy part of the DNA that we wanna insert into our fish. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna open up our DNA in this spe uh, specific uh, recognition site. These little ends that are kinda of hanging out here, these are known as sticky ends. And they're sticky because they're not happy. They wanna be paired up with their fellow nucleotide, A with T, C's with G's, right? But they don't have that other site. So this is known as the sticky end because they're dying to just grab onto somebody and bind with someone. So in this case, all you'd have to do is if you have these two sticky ends here, is insert almost kind of like a complementary section of DNA that would fit those, those sticky ends. So that's what we've got right here. This is our new gene with our new DNA, right? All we have to do, because that's gonna be our expression region right there, all we have to do is attach it to the sticky ends right here, and now on the inside, we have that designated part of DNA that we're trying to insert, right? That genetic recombination, we're trying to recombine with this particular DNA. So again, we have a recognition site that basically gets recognized by the restriction enzyme. This is where I'm trying to go. This is what I wanna cut. This is where I wanna insert. So this enzyme is gonna come in here, it's gonna open up your DNA, split it, 
You have these open ends right here that are not happy, they want to be paired up, but they're open so they're sticky ends. All you have to do is attach a complementary piece of DNA that's going to fit either of the sticky ends with the gene in the middle, the gene that you want in the middle, okay, and then boom, you're going to have those complementary base pairs which are going to recombine with each other, the A's, the T's, the C's, the G's, and now we have our little bit of our inserted DNA, that's the glowy part that we're trying to get, you know, our fish to glow. And now we have our full bit of DNA, right, which is going to be reconnected by what's called DNA ligase. We didn't talk too much about it, but basically helicase is what's going to open up your DNA and ligase is going to attach it again. So now all we've just had is this DNA ligase come in and just reattach our DNA here at the sticky ends so that now we have a full complete bit of DNA that's not broken up into little bits. So recognition site, that's where you want to cut. This restriction enzyme is going to come in, open up your DNA. Now you have these little sticky ends right here. All you have to do is attach complementary ends with the desired gene that you want in the middle, and then you're going to replace it. Um, and basically, DNA ligase is going to come in and just kind of make sure that everything is attached, and now you have your um, complete recombined DNA. All right, so. Another useful thing, if you're not just trying to make fun things like glowy, glowy fish or dinosaurs, right, what we can do is what's called uh, DNA profiling. And this is really, really useful when it comes to things like um, forensics. You know, you have a crime scene and you found some blood and you have a couple suspects, then you can narrow it down. Another really useful tool is paternity, right? You don't know who the father is, you're on Maury, and this is exactly how they find out and they do that um, the paternal test is by basically testing little parts of your DNA. Now remember our DNA is really, 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 really long, so you don't want to test the whole thing because that would take forever. So what you do is you basically look at these little parts of the DNA that are in, call, in what's called non-coding regions. So remember the coding regions are going to code for things like your genes, right? Your DNA, which is going to express in things like your traits. Well, a lot of your DNA doesn't really express anything. But it's still really useful because there are variabilities in that DNA so that between people we can look at the differences. Specifically, usually what we're looking at here is what's called short tandem repeats or also known as STIRBs. So if you've ever seen this as STIRBs, this is what it's, it means, short tandem repeats. So what they do is they basically look at these non-coding sections of your DNA, and everybody has the same non-coding sections, and they look at the number of repeating sequences that you have. So these STIRBs are repeats because they're little sections of DNA that just repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat, sometimes a really long time. Um, sometimes they're very short, sometimes they're very long, and there can be different between people. So what we do is we look at those and we compare. How short are your stirs versus my stirs? If the crime scene had six, six stirs and you have 10, okay, obviously, it's probably not gonna be you. Now, if this seems confusing, we're gonna watch a video in just a second, so don't worry about it. So essentially what we have here is we have stir site one and stir site two. Remember, we have lots of these different stir sites. What you do, what you want to do is you want to compare a few of them. You don't want to just compare one because, you know, coincidentally, you could have 10 and the, the uh, murderer could have 10, right? And then you're like, oh my God, I'm not the murderer. So you don't want to look at just one single site. You want to look at many sites to make sure that if you match every single one of them, then the chances of the murderer being someone else are very, very low. It probably was you because your DNA matches almost, well, it would match identically, and therefore the chances of it being somebody else are extremely rare, so pretty much it's you. So here's what we look at. So we look at two different stir sites in this example. Again, in real life, we probably look at a lot more, maybe like 12 or 13. Okay, so we have these little repeating sections right here. So this would be A-G-A-T, 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 right? It's just repeating. It's the same little sequence over and over and over and over and over again. So what you can do is you can, almost, you can actually count how many repeats there are. And people, like I said, are going to have different number of repeats depending on the person. So if we look at this stir site, right, and we can see, okay, they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stirs in this particular um, site. In this one, they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so if I were to compare just one stir site, you see that this has seven and this has seven. So the crime scene DNA matches the suspect's DNA. Okay, great. However, remember this, you don't want to just look at one site. So now we look over here at stir site number two, and we can say this one has eight. Uh-oh. But our suspect has like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 
So now because we looked at multiple stir site, we know this suspect is not the right suspect. Yes, the first stir site did match up perfectly, but the second one didn't, which means it's not his DNA. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. If not, we're going to watch a video on it. But again, all you're doing is counting the short repeated segments, right? Because you, everybody has a certain amount, right? And the difference differs between people. So maybe stir site one, you have seven, stir site two, you have eight, stir site three, you have 14, who knows? Um, but again, that's what you look at. You look at all these different stir sites and if every single one of them comes up with the exact same number as you, the chances are very, very, very low that it could have possibly been someone else. Realistically, it was probably you. So don't do crimes because this is how they catch you. Okay, so another really useful tool in DNA profiling is what's called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Okay, so what polymerase chain reaction does is it actually increases the DNA sample. So say you were at a crime scene and say you just had a little tiny, one little tiny drop of blood or one hair that got pulled out with just a little bit of DNA. That's usually not enough to actually do sampling with. So what you do is you run it through a polymerase chain reaction. Essentially what this does is it makes more DNA. Remember that DNA is complementary. This strand matches this strand. So really all you need is one side of the strand, like remember when you we were talking about RNA, and now you know both of them. So what polymerase chain reaction does is it kind of opens up the strands and it makes copies of the first half and copies of the second half. Now you have more DNA and you do that again and again and again and again and again. So all you're doing is you're increasing the sample so you can actually run all of your different tools and um, sorry, all of your different tests with. So essentially you have this tiny little fragment of DNA, just this tiny little bit right here. So what the DNA polymerase chain reaction is going to do is it's going to open up that DNA, right? So this strand's going to go this way and get copied. This strand's going to go this way and its half is going to get copied. Then they're going to open them again, copy this bottom strand, this bottom strand, copy it again, copy it again, copy it again, copy it again. Again, this is increasing the amount of DNA that we have for testing. This is how you can go from a tiny little blood droplet, one single blood droplet at a crime scene, and we can actually do all of these different tests to say, yeah, for sure, you did it, you're the, you know, you're the suspect, you're the murderer. Okay, so this is the um, increasing the DNA. So this is not actually a way of sampling your DNA, but it's a way of increasing the amount of DNA you have to sample so that you can still do all of those tests. Now, this is actually how you do the DNA sampling, okay? So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be taking those little stirs and we can actually put them in what's called a gel electrophoresis. So this can actually help us determine the number of stirs because what's gonna happen is this, they're gonna get separated by size. So you inject the DNA into these little wells, you run an electrical current through it, always goes from negative to positive, always goes from negative to positive, the negative end is the black end. The positive end is the red end. If, this, we, if we were actually doing this in class, which is really kind of a bummer because we used to do this in class. Um, so I'm sorry you guys are gonna miss it, but I'm sure we have some kind of online lab for you guys to do this. Um, but the trick is that you always run towards red. You always run towards red, meaning it's gonna run from the negative end to the positive end. So if that's ever on a test question, it runs to red, right? Negative to positive. So what we do is we chopped up some of our DNA into little bits of fragments. We inserted them into each of these little sample tubes and then we took a little bit of that and we put it into these wells. Next up, we're gonna run that electrical current through it. It's gonna run towards red, it's gonna run towards a positive. I know, I keep saying run towards red and this is negative. It's just this slideshow. Normally, black is um, negative and red is positive, so you're always running towards red. Think about like a car battery. Red is always gonna be positive. So we're running towards red and these little tiny fragments are gonna get separated, like I said, by size. So as they get separated by size, they're gonna rest or they're gonna finally be um, stopped in certain places, okay? So the smaller fragments are gonna go fastest or the farthest. So the smaller fragments are gonna go all the way down here. The larger fragments are harder to move, so they're gonna be um, up here, because you know they're heavier, they're larger. Okay, so what we see right here is what we're trying to do is match up our sample to the suspect sample, okay? So we have all of these different bands and what you do is you read it directly across. So say this is our crime scene sample right here. This is suspect number one and this is suspect number two. Okay, so if you match these up, okay, the first one matches. Oh, second one doesn't match. 
This guy doesn't have a match. Okay, that one matches. Again, this is why we test lots of different sections of your DNA, not just one or two, because coincidentally, you could have that. Okay, that one matches. That one doesn't match. That one doesn't match. Okay, so that's what you're looking for. You're looking to see how many of these match. So in this case, that one matches. That one doesn't match. That one matches. That one doesn't match. Okay, so in this case, I would say neither one of these guys would be the, the um, actual uh, Crime? <laughs> what am I looking for here? The actual um, suspect, the criminal. Ha, <laughs> there's the word I'm looking for. So this would not be the murderer, right? Neither one of these would be the murderer, but we're gonna look at some examples where you actually can tell who the murderer was. Okay, so we're gonna get to that in just a second, right after the video, uh, right after we talk about this. So uh, another way of chopping up these little fragments is if you're not gonna look at the stir sites, you can look at what's known as RFLP, Right? Shortened from a very longer word. Don't worry about that. Okay, so what we're looking at is we're looking at this type of analysis that actually cuts it into those little fragments. Okay, so if we're not looking at stirs, we can look at these. Uh, Roofs <laughs> is what you're looking at. Okay, so based on these specific what's called restriction enzymes, we go in there and we chop up the DNA in very specific sites. So you're going to chop it here and you're going to create this little fragment. You're going to chop it here, you're going to create this little fragment. And then what you're looking for is you're looking at those particular fragments. Do those fragments match the suspect's fragments? If they do, then it is your DNA, right? You are the criminal. If not, okay, then perhaps you didn't do it, right? Because these don't match up. So this is another way of kind of like analyzing your data and looking at if you are the suspect or not, or if, sorry, if you are the criminal or not. All right, so the same kind of thing is gonna happen. We're gonna either use the STIRS or we're gonna use the RFLPs and we're gonna look at the RFPLs, there it is. Uh, we're gonna be looking at the different segments of DNA. Does this one match this one through that gel electrophoresis? Um, so you can see right here again, we're gonna isolate the DNA from the crime scene, from suspect one, from suspect two. We're going to basically amplify the DNA with the PCR. Remember, we're increasing the amount of DNA. Okay, so now we have a big sample for each of them. We chop it up into those little tiny segments. We put each of those little tiny DNA segments into the wells. The wells are going to, sorry, the gel electrophoresis is gonna run, right? That electrical current is gonna separate the DNA based on the size. And then all you have to do is match the crime scene to one of the suspects. So looking at this, which suspect do you think committed the crime? Suspect one or suspect two? Okay, so all we gotta do is compare the two. So let's look at suspect one. Okay, yes, he's got the first one. Oh, doesn't have the second one, doesn't have that one. That one matches up, but that one doesn't match up, that one doesn't match up, and only this bottom one down here matches up. So it looks like suspect one is in the clear. He didn't do it. Suspect two. Okay, we have this one matches up. Oh, that one matches up. That one matches up. Oh, that one matches up. And this one matches up. Every single one of these little tiny segments matches up, which means, sorry, suspect two, but you are the criminal. You did it. Okay, so this is how we can do it. We basically amplify the very small sample of DNA that we get using the polymerase chain reaction and then using one of these different DNA profiling tools. Um, we can actually run a gel electrophoresis and chop up our little samples and run them here and see, okay, which as actually are criminal. Suspect one, suspect two, suspect three, and in this case, it was suspect two. So if you want to practice this, again, you can find these online and just do um, sample uh, DNA profiling and then again, just read it directly across. The more of them that match, the more closely they are related to the criminal. So because some of these still do match, uh, that one matches, this one matches, right? Suspect two might be, I don't know, a relative of suspect one. So if you have almost all of them matching, but just a couple of them are off, you're probably related to the criminal, right? So you might not be the criminal, but maybe you're the criminal's son, daughter, et cetera. So that's what you, um, that's what another thing that you can look at here. Um, let's go watch a video. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about DNA fingerprinting. We sometimes refer to this as DNA profiling or your genetic fingerprint. And basically, it started with this guy, Alec Jeffries. Basically, in his lab, he was working with x ray and looking at 
um, DNA, and what he figured out is he could tell a lot about a person by their looking at their DNA, quote unquote, fingerprint. In other words, he could see who they were related to or who they weren't. Um, he could tell paternity, for example. And so he was working at the University of, University of Leicester and basically figured out this whole idea of DNA fingerprinting. This is around 1984. And basically for the next three years, all DNA fingerprinting on the planet went through this university. And so eventually it was privatized and this is everywhere. And it'll probably eventually be replaced by just DNA sequencing, sequencing all the letters in DNA. But to make it understandable, essentially what we have in a human is we have long linear segments of, of DNA, but within that we have these genes. And so 99.9% .9 of our DNA in everyone is going to be exactly the same. The genes are going to be the same, but you're, again, you're going to have different copies or alleles of those genes. That's what makes you, you. But if we look into this area in the middle, we used to call this junk DNA, but now we know it's really important in controlling gene expression. We find that there's quite a bit of variability in here, which shouldn't surprise us, because this, the gene, makes the protein, and the protein makes the phenotype, and that's really what natural selection is selecting for or against. But this in the middle can go crazy, and so it does. And so an example of one that we use in DNA fingerprinting is something called short tandem repeat. Uh, originally, we started with something called VNTR, variable number tandem repeats, and you'll find in DNA sequencing that you have all kinds of, so we had STRs, we had VNTRs, before that we had restriction, fragment length, uh, polymorphisms, and so there's a bunch of different things that we could look at, but we're kind of moved to this idea of these short tandem repeats, they work great, there's quite a bit of variability in individuals. And so what is it? You basically have letters of DNA that repeat over and 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 over. And over. So sometimes you know, 50 times it repeats. And so what does that look like? Well, if we have these three individuals, we'll call this Mr. Blonde, Mrs. Red, and then Mr. Mustache. And so if we look at these three people, their genes are going to be the same. But these STRs are going to be different. These single or short tandem repeats are going to be different. You can see that Mr. Blonde has more than Mr. Mustache and less than uh, Mrs. Red. And so if I make that a little bit easier to, to grasp onto, if I count them out, and then remove everything else, what we get is variability between all individuals. Everything else was the same, but we see variability in here. Um, and we can cut these sections out using restriction enzymes, and then we can amplify them using polymerase chain reaction, and then we can separate them using gel electrophoresis. So how does that work? Basically, I'll take the DNA and I'll put them in a little well. And so we're looking down on this. And so this is an agarose gel. I could put Mrs. Red's and then Mr. Mustache. I could put those all in DNA. Basically, I would then turn on the voltage. So there's going to be a positive charge here, negative charge up here. DNA is a negative charge, and so it's going to be pulled towards the positive. And so what's going to happen is those little fragments of DNA are going to migrate. And so what does that allow me to do? It allows me to tell the difference between each of these individuals. And so this is their fingerprint. But you can tell that this is a really bad fingerprint because we've got some, these two are exactly the same here. And so in, when they really do DNA profiling, what they do is they generally use 13 different sections like this. And then those 13 sections are each going to be highly variable. So it's a good way to tell who's who. When would we ever want to do this? Forensics is one reason. And then also in maternity, figuring out who's dad. And so let's talk about the murder. There was a murder that was committed. Somebody was brutally murdered by one of these three suspects, so Mr. Blonde, Mrs. Red, or Mr. Mustache. But they left blood at the scene. And so what I can do is I can grab samples of DNA from each of our um, suspects, and then I could grab the blood itself, and then I could do DNA fingerprinting. So before we separate them, you may think to yourself, which of these looks guilty? Who looks like they're capable? And if we separate them then using that gel, what we can see is that Mr. Blonde is guilty. In other words, his blood matches up the crime scene. And so how, what do I mean by matching up? Well, those single or those short tandem repeats, if we look vert horizontally, are going to be exactly lined up. And if we were to look at Mr. Blonde's son, we'd find more similarities than we would between the other. So basically, that's DNA profiling, DNA fingerprinting. It's much more sophisticated than that, but again, it's kind of on its way out. We'll eventually replace this with DNA sequencing. In the US, we, um, 
the FBI has started creating this database of DNA, which is a little scary. And basically, what they use are 13 different areas within the chromosome or the genome, and then they're looking at those short tandem repeats in there. Um, now, why do I say that's a little bit scary? I think you really want to protect your DNA because as we learn more and more about genetics, what's going to be found in your DNA? Well, predisposition to Alzheimer's or breast cancer, any of these things, which your insurance company would love to get a hold of. And so, um, and it also doesn't answer the idea of Mr. Blonde, did he really do it? I mean, did the police frame him and then contaminate the blood? Um, so we don't know that. All it does tell us is if we have two samples of DNA, the odds of two people having the same DNA fingerprint are astronomical, unless they're identical. Okay, so hopefully that video really helped you and kind of give you a, a good idea, especially with those animations of what's going on and how to actually use this DNA technology to determine who the criminal was or not. So really super useful in things like paternity and things like forensics, so we can actually determine who is the criminal, right? Who was the murderer? And if you watch any forensic files or anything like that, this is exactly what they're doing. It's all this DNA technology that allows us to go back even years later and determine, yes, you were the criminal, yes, you were the murderer, etc. Now, some other type of DNA technology, which you've probably heard about, either positive or negative, is what's called genetically modified organisms, or GMOs. Now, as soon as people start to hear about genetically modified, everyone freaks out and goes, oh my God, this is all bad, everything's bad, this is really bad for us. Well, I hate to break it to you, but we've been genetically modifying food for years. In fact, for thousands of years. Yeah, modern day corn, which is, you know, big size, big whole, you know, kernel of corn. Yeah, that's good, right? That modern day corn was genetically modified for far by farmers for hundreds or hundreds of years. Realistic corn, actual wild corn, it's about that big. Right? That's not going to feed your family at a barbecue. Right? You want a big hunk and, you know, husk of, horn, of corn that you can actually eat. Right? And this is through that we've actually accomplished through genetic modification. So what farmers have done is, even though it's not actually in the lab, is if this corn plant, you know, grew really, really big kernels, kernels, corns, cobs, there it is, cobs. This one grew really, really big cobs, and this one grew really small cobs. Right? They would stop planting the corn that grew small cobs, and they would only plant the ones that did really large cobs. Okay? That alone is genetic modification. You're choosing what's called artificial selection. You're selecting for those traits that you want. You're not selecting for the traits you don't want. You are selecting for the traits you do. And then what you can do is you can actually crossbreed two um, corn plants that actually produce really big cobs. So this corn plant produces big cobs, this corn plant produces big cobs. Let's literally splice them together. This is just artificial insemination of plants. People have done it for years. They're plants, so it's like essentially pollinating them, you know, with the plants that you want. Instead of having bees pollinate, right, you artificially pollinate. So then you pollinate these corns with two different, um, from two different plants that grow really, really big cobs, and then you get a plant, a third plant, right, their offspring that has even bigger cobs. So this is something that we've been doing for years, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So not all GMOs are bad, okay? So when people say, hey, GMOs, ah, you really kind of have to get, take it with a grain of salt and actually do a little bit more research on it. Well, how is it genetically modified? What genes was it modified with? Because now we are beginning to do things in the lab. So we are coming up with things like um, pesticide-resistant plants, okay? So these pesticides are used to kill bugs. But these plants now kind of sometimes die because it is a poison. So what you do is you can actually modify some of these plants like corn, tomatoes, strawberries to be resistant to pesticides. So you spray them with the pesticides, kills all the bugs, doesn't kill the plant, doesn't hurt the fruit. So in that case, the farmers get a yet much higher yield for their, uh, for their crops and their produce and stuff. And so that is a good thing. You can also grow things like tomatoes that are much larger than they would be in the wild. So say you're a starving village in, you know, some third world country and someone tells you, oh, GMOs are bad. And you're like, yeah, well, if I didn't, didn't have GMOs, we wouldn't be able to feed our entire family. Okay, so it's not always a bad thing. You do have to look at it with a grain of salt. So yes, genetic modification can be good. Yes, genetic modification can be bad. It all depends on how you're modifying it, what you're modifying it. 
So a lot of the times now we're getting into modifying things for like increased shelf life so that it can sit on the shelf for so much longer. That might not be a great thing because if it can sit on the shelf for so much longer, it's probably going to sit in your body for so much longer, right? It's going to probably be pretty hard for your body to digest it if it's got increased shelf life. So in that case, it might not be bad, good for say, you know, the producers of it, like that, whoever produced that product or grew that tomato, right? But maybe not so good for the consumers and when we're actually eating that. So again, you do have to take it with a grain of salt, not always bad, not always good. We really have to kind of like do some investigations on our own. Uh, with that said, let's talk about some of the organisms that are modified in this country. We've already talked about corn, but pretty much, you know, almost all the corn and all the soybeans and stuff like that are genetically modified. So if you've ever eaten anything with corn in it, you're eating a GMO. Did you die? No. Are you okay? Yeah, probably. So again, not always necessarily a bad thing. Um, what else? Ah, this is golden rice right here. Golden rice is basically genetically modified to have extra vitamin A. So some of these villages that can't get balanced diets, they don't have a Whole Foods down the street, they don't have a Ralph's down the street, right? They can't, they basically are at the mercy of what's available. So in this case, these whole villages have had vitamin A deficiencies, which cause all sorts of bad things. So what they've done is they actually genetically, genetically modified white rice into what's called yellow rice, which has a lot of vitamin A. So now all of those vitamin A deficient um, people can actually get all the vitamin A that they need just by eating this rice, which normally would not have a high concentrations of vitamin A. So again, are you really gonna tell, are you gonna shake your fist at those people and be like, hey, genetically modified foods are bad. And they're like, well, I'm not dying now because I have all the vitamin A that I need. I mean, it's kind of an extreme case, but still. Um, it's not, again, always a bad thing. And we have been doing it for a pretty long time now at this point, we're getting pretty good at it. Uh, let's see. So people who are cautious about it, again, we don't know necessarily the long-term repercussions of this. This is why you always want to look at anything with a grain of salt, right? Well, yeah, okay, it may be bad, it may not be bad, let's do the further research. And this is what scientists are doing now. So we're still trying to figure out this stuff. We're still trying to figure out if there are negative repercussions or not. Um, so some of the ways that people are worried about this is not, you know, okay, increased shelf life, which increases it inside of us. But it could be something like, what if you're genetically modifying that corn and those new genes affect something else in the environment? You don't know what's going to happen. Say you genetically modified the corn, but that corn now kills all the bees, right? You don't know that that's a repercussion of it. So this is things that people are worried about. Now, have we seen this so far? No. Is it a possibility that it could come up in the future? Sure. This is why people are keeping an eye on this. But this is some of the things that those non-GMOers are like, ah, oh, we don't know the repercussions. So again, something we're still looking into. Um, we don't know that genetically modifying these foods isn't going to be bad for us, right? What if that yellow rice, yes, has all that vitamin A that you need, but it causes cancer later. So again, these are things that we don't know. Have we shown this to be true? No. Could it be true in the future? Potentially. Again, something that we're looking into, something that we're still doing research on. Um, GMO, GMO plants might also pass those modified genes to other plants in the environment. You planted genetically modified corn next to, um, you know, a forest. I don't know why you're planting corn near a forest, but what if you did, right? So now all those genes from the forest might get into the other plant species nearby and might affect those trees. Again, have we seen this? Not really, but could it be a possibility? Of course. This is why we're keeping an eye on, on things like that. But this is usually what the, the naysayers are saying is, oh, we can't do this because it could do all of these things, right? So again, something that we're keeping an eye out for. Now, uh, ethical reasons. Remember, I already told you guys that we're kind of picking and choosing the genes that we want, like when we made the glowy, glowy fish, right? We took that glowy, um, Pro, we, I think it's a glowing fungus is what it is, basically the DNA from a fungus, and we inserted it into a fish, and now we have glowy fish. Okay, well, could we potentially start doing this with people, with, like, larger animals? Yeah, and this is, again, the ethical issues where it kind of comes in. Is this going to be good for us? Should we really tweak with our bodies and tweak with our babies, potentially? Um, and, again, it could be, eh, it could go either way. So some people are like, yes, 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 because we can take out things like Alzheimer's. We can take out things like Parkinson's or at least a risk for them. But then other people are like, well, now you're messing with God's plan and blah, blah, blah and all that. So again, it's kind of got their ethical issues to it as well. 
Um, doing this, genetically modifying some of these organisms might create like super bacteria, right? Bacteria that are resistant to everything else. We're talking about resist pesticide resistant plants can't, you know, but the bugs become pesticide resistant, which then the bacteria becomes pesticide resistant and so forth and so on. So there is a lot of potential hazardous stuff that could happen if we do this wrong. And that's why we're keeping an eye out for it, you know. Um, these are some really, really great uh, videos that I want you guys to watch on your own. Um, I'm not going to show them to you guys now, but again, watch them all, especially the end of the genetic diseases. This is where genetically modifying is not necessarily a bad thing. We can get rid of those genetically transmitted diseases that we know about. Things like sickle cells, things like Parkinson's or, or Alzheimer's, things that you're at risk for. We can actually go in there and snip out that part of your DNA. So in that case, it's not really a bad thing, but... Again, the people have lots of different ethical issues on why it might be. So make sure to watch all three of these videos, guys. And with that, I will leave you and I will say, huh, right? No jeans allowed inside the club. Um, anyway, I hope you guys have a wonderful week and I will see you very soon with our next lecture, chapter 14. All right, have a good one.